Ahsoka Part 6 Far, Far Away We find Ahsoka and Hu Yang continue to ride the Purgle to the new galaxy. And while this is their only scene in the entire episode, it is a good one. As it's pretty much official, the hole in a galaxy far, far away becomes now a canon in-universe saying, which is pretty cool. But alright, the moment we've all been waiting for happens. As the Eye of Scion finally arrives on Peridia, the ancient homeworld of the Daphimiri, which is interesting as shouldn't they be called in that case Peridi or something like that instead? That's a bit strange, but making Peridia become a planet essentially known as the Purgle Graveyard, literally the place where they come just to die, really adds to the whole chilling atmosphere that this planet is trying to go for, and I like that a lot. Anyway, once arriving, Morgan, Balin, Shin, and Sabine meet the Great Mothers a group of Night Sisters that have allied themselves with Thrawn, and the ones who were supposedly communicating with Morgan this entire time. And well, let me just say, props to Filoni here as these actually look like legit Night Sisters, unlike Morgan, who obviously is a normal human and looks nothing like them. Yet, you know, she claims to be one. Then again, it's 2023, maybe she identifies as one, who knows. Either way, I really hope Filoni doesn't tiptoe around this as I still want to learn more about Morgan. But for the time being, I'm simply treating her as a human that was adopted into Nightsister culture rather than being, you know, a female Zabrak. But yeah, as they all wait for the Grand Admiral's arrival, Balin mentions to Shin about his reasons for wanting to help Thrawn. As he talks about his belief that the fall of the Jedi and the rise of the Empire were part of an inevitable cycle, which neither side in history wanted to learn from, and basically a cycle that he intends to break. So does this mean that he's trying to end the Jedi once and for all by helping Thrawn rise to power? I mean, sure, it seems that way, but at the same time, Balin's actions are nonetheless somehow still vague and questionable to the point that, I mean, even Thrawn is fully not on board with him. And speaking of which, Thrawn does make his eventual grand arrival with his signature Star Destroyer, the Chimera, which clearly is not in the best of shape. It's no doubt a spectacle to see in live action, that's for sure, but I do have a question for Filoni here, basically around the Chimera, as how did it not run out of fuel yet after all of these years? which has been around 10 years if I'm doing my math correct. We know that Star Destroyers need to and get refueled as seen in other Star Wars media, and considering that I'm highly doubting that there is an Imperial refueling station in this new galaxy, then uh, seriously, what gives? Either Filoni forgot about this or Thrawn had to find a new source of fuel. Which I very much hope is the case, and if so, does at the very least get mentioned. Now, I'm overall happy with Thrawn's live-action portrayal. Yes, it's not perfect, as I would have fixed up his hairline a bit and not made him have, you know, a belly. But I suppose those aspects can be forgiven, given that he's older here than when we saw him in Rebels. That said, given that he was stranded in this new galaxy for so long with limited resources, you'd also still think that he'd be skinnier, leaner. Not to mention Thrawn was known to exercise a lot, even actively training against Imperial Sentry droids just for fun. So either he gave up on that and just ate all of the rations left on the Chimera all for himself, leaving little to none for his troops, or this is just a lifestyle change on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I'm nitpicking here. I'm still glad to see Lars Mikkelsen portray Thrawn just like he did in Rebels, and that alone is one big plus for me regardless of everything else. 
That said, I do like the small details on his outfit, which show that he's been living under difficult conditions. Especially his troops, whose armor features cracks filled with gold and gray accents and red stripes of fabric. Clearly, they've been through a lot, and being unable to resupply and rekit themselves, then I'd suppose they'd had to make do. And that red fabric, I'm pretty sure has something to do with the Night Sisters as well. As hey, they are called the Night Troopers now, which is interesting. So yeah, likely the Night Sisters were perhaps involved somehow in repairing the Stormtroopers' armor, or maybe even more as there are certainly rumors floating around that these troopers are apparently undead, awakened simply through Night Sister magic. And personally, I'm not a fan of this, I'm just gonna say it out right now, as for me, there would have to be a good explanation on how Thrawn ended up having his entire army killed, but yet he managed to survive. Plus, Thrawn was one to care about his men, so I don't see a scenario where he would willingly murder them all just to revive them later as undead soldiers. Then again, maybe Thrawn has changed over the years. Uh, food was tight and he wanted to snag it all for himself, hence the dad bod. And then finally, there's also Enoch. Thrawn's new right-hand man, who has obviously significantly modified his armor, like replacing his faceplate with a golden humanoid-looking mask that's a bit disturbing, I might say. Not to mention making his helmet vocoder sound all robotic. Yeah, there's no doubt a lot of questions about Thrawn, Enoch, and his night troopers, and really... I kind of now wouldn't mind a mini-series of sort showing their survival in this new galaxy since being stranded there in the Rebels finale. I think that would be really interesting to watch. But right, going back to my previous point with Balin, I was correct in my theory in being that Thrawn wouldn't be particularly fond of him. Sure, Thrawn can see and accept that Balin helped Morgan and all, and he's the main reason that they're even meeting, but still. Balin is a former Jedi, of which Thrawn doesn't trust, and even still calls him a Jedi nonetheless. Plus, he's quite clearly very ready to dispose of him too, when he can at the right moment. But if he can manipulate and use Balin before doing that, then why not? However, I was somewhat wrong with how Thrawn would react to Sabine, as I said he would want to kill her, to which he, yeah, he technically still does. But because Thrawn doesn't know the whereabouts of Ezra, then he agrees that he can use Sabine to solve this little problem of his. And then of course after that, killing them both. Which is fair, as my theory didn't involve with Thrawn after all of this time, not even knowing where Ezra is. Thrawn does honor Balin's promise to Sabine by providing her with provisions, a howler mount, and the latest intelligence on Ezra's whereabouts. But after Sabine leaves, Thrawn orders Balin and Shin to follow her at their own pace so they can kill both her and Ezra. Balin seems to not have a problem with this, yet Shin does, as for her, he's not honoring his word to Sabine. Which, I mean, technically he is, as he only told Sabine she'd be safe and reunited with Ezra, which does turn out to be true in this episode. But he never said he wouldn't kill her after they're reunited. It's also important to mention that in this scene, the wall behind them of the Paradia ruins seems to have ancient Zetho script. So yeah, that only adds more questions to this new galaxy, as perhaps this is where the Zetho originated from, or maybe they fled to. Who knows, but it's interesting stuff nonetheless and I'm liking it. On her journey, Sabine ends up surviving an ambush by some nomad bandits, initially losing to them with her Mandalorian fighting skills and needing to rely on Ezra's lightsaber to win. 
Not to mention that she herself is incredibly lucky that these dumb bandits didn't target her head. As without her Beskar helmet, she'd be dead by now. Anyway, there is some lighthearted comedy here and there with her confronting the cowardice of her howler that abandoned her, as well later encountering the native alien race of Paradia, known as the Noti. And it's by following them to their village where she finally is reunited with Ezra. And yeah, while I'll say that I still would have preferred Mina Masad for the role, Iman Isfandi wasn't a terrible pick either, and hey, he also looks exactly like Ezra's dad too, which is funny. But again, there's more questions here on how Ezra managed to survive this long by himself, especially without going insane. Not to mention, it's a bit strange that it took Sabine only a few hours, if that's to find him. As it only makes me wonder now how Thrawn was unable to find Ezra for 10 years while both being on the same planet, as come on. Thrawn has a Star Destroyer, TIE Fighters, an army of Stormtroopers, as well Night Sister Magic at his disposal. Not to mention Ezra is defenseless too without his lightsaber. So again, what was Thrawn doing these past 10 years? Like, if he really wanted to find Ezra, you'd think he would have found him ages ago, right? Elsewhere, while tracking Sabine, Balin begins to sense that there is a greater power on Paradia and tells Shin that he intends to find and use it. And if that's the case, does that mean he's going to go against Thrawn's orders now and won't kill Sabine and Ezra? Huh. Back at the ruins, we see the night troopers load the chimera with a ton of what looks to be these space coffins, I guess. With Thrawn saying that it will take three days to complete. So, huh, does that mean that they will be stuck on Paradia for two more episodes if we're already counting this episode as day one? If true, then I suppose that might confirm that Thrawn returning back to the main galaxy will be sort of a cliffhanger ending for the finale. Basically, sort of a teaser for Filoni's movie. Mm, I still don't know how to feel about that, but at the same time, I can't say I'm surprised. Thrawn then after is soon warned by the Night Sisters that they sense Ahsoka coming with the Purgle. Cool, so Thrawn can now be fully prepared for Ahsoka's arrival, but at the same time, you're telling me the Night Sisters can sense Ahsoka approaching from another galaxy through hyperspace, yet they can't feel Ezra just hanging out with his buddies a mile away in an alien snail trailer park. Ah, <sighs> I don't know, man, I don't know. Overall, this was a darn enjoyable and a visually pleasing episode to watch. Sure, it felt more like an Andor episode if anything, due to there being more talking and less action per se. And maybe that's why I enjoyed it so much. The world building here was simply incredible and left me with so many questions. And that's well for both good and not so good reasons. Yes, there are issues present here, but I'd say the pros far more outweigh the cons, and I was left happy with what I saw. And really, how can I complain about that? This was a good episode, and we can only expect things to get better from here on out. And that was my take on this episode of Ahsoka. Let me know what you all thought about the episode in the comments below. And if you haven't already, remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.